Oh. Okay. Um, so this is the third in the second series of TCAS Talks. Um, this afternoon, we have Laura Ratcliffe Warren speaking on recent work from uh, Penwith Landscape Partnership. Uh, it's to do with the more ancient side of things, and Laura is a conservator. Um, and uh, very happy to have Laura here. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Ryan. Coming here. Nice. You would speak on that? About if I've got everything across, okay, but I think so. Yeah, I mean, um, conservator, but also sort of archaeology, I suppose, and collections care. It's a slightly strange job that I'm doing in that it incorporates all sorts of different facets of um, archaeology. Perhaps a few unexpected kind of connections, but I'll I'll explain. So I'm the ancient Penwell officer at the moment. Uh, for Penwith Landscape Partnership, uh, which is a five-year lottery funded project um, working in West Penwith and um, telling people about the amazing history there is part of my job. So I will um, share my screen with you now. Hopefully it will work. It is a team of us, there's about, uh, there's 10 members of staff and the project works not just with archaeology in the area, it's uh, we work with farmers, um, ecology, um, listed buildings and um, community groups uh, and also some of the parish, the parish groups as well, sort of helping them with their parish plans and sort of surveys within their parishes and um, also access. So we do a lot of work on footpaths. Um, the part of the project that I'm particularly concerned with is the is a selection of ancient sites that were chosen to sort of represent a good a good selection of the sites on show in Penwith, but but particularly ones that were suffering uh, troubles or fallen on hard times or were classed as at risk. If they were scheduled monuments, they may well have been on the heritage at risk register. Uh, so sort of good good reason to give them a bit of attention. Um, and, and uh, they were sort of generally chosen because they were sites where the activities that were required would mean that we could train up train up volunteers to help uh, and do something useful and hopefully continue on after the project had finished. So the area west West Penwith, quite a large area, um, very dense in heritage, a sort of uh, one of the oldest continually used uh, prehistoric areas of farmland in Europe. So, so not just sort of special within Great Britain, special within sort of Europe as well. Um, large areas of it remain quite unchanged since prehistoric time in the sense of the sort of uh, the structure of the landscape features, I suppose. Um, so we sort of re refer to it as a living historic landscape because it is um, very rich in historic landscape features of hedge boundaries, um, monuments, uh, very old field systems being the, the most obvious remnant, I suppose, uh, around which everything else sort of sits, I suppose. Uh, the, you sort of notice the field systems first and then when you start exploring all the other things pop out at you. So this is a very long history of farming um, all the way back to early prehistory. Um, it probably hasn't changed much over time because the landscape itself is quite particular, it's, it's very granitic, um, the soil is quite acidic, it's, it's good for grazing cattle but not so much for sheep. Uh, it, there's, you're fairly limited in the sort of things that you can do on that sort of landscape and make a subsistence living. So when you're sort of not using modern farming techniques, uh, you're sort of reasonably restricted. And once you find something that works, it tends to keep on working. So you, there's not an enormous opportunity to change what you're doing there. So I think that's helped consolidate sort of the, the way of working the land and sort of perpetuate it a bit 
a bit longer, well, quite considerably longer than, than might have happened elsewhere in the country. So you you sort of come across this sort of a particular way of doing things. People quite often think of West Penwith as a sort of a little area unto itself, really, within Cornwall. Um, and it is particularly dense for the survival of these sort of prehistoric sites, features, um, landscape, remnants. Uh, uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, I mean, there's 7,821 recorded monuments or areas or zones of historic activity, so field systems, houses, roundhouses, settlements, castles, uh, standing stones, uh, all sorts of megalithic monuments, and then sort of through to mining, and then it's sort of post-medieval uh, features associated with settlements. So really quite a lot, very, very dense um, within Cornwall and, and within the country, just generally. Uh, we've got 261 scheduled monuments, which is quite a lot. Um, sort of two and a bit thousand listed buildings. So it, there's, there's lots going on. And scheduled monuments don't necessarily just refer to um, a particular site, uh, a castle, for example, a hill fort. They, they, they can be large areas of features so you might have an, an entire hill slope scheduled because it is particularly rich in um, preserved field boundaries or, or something like that so it, big areas we're talking here not just like a small stone here and a small stone there so quite um, quite rare to have these large swathes of landscape so well preserved and if you look on the Cornwall Council interact map where they designate landscape character to, to particular zones of the landscape. Uh, so the, the, the character behind that type of landscape, what's, what's helped it look like the sort of landscape that it is today. The surviving prehistoric farmland really does predominate um, in West Penwith. You get it on Bodmin Moor as well, but you can see the cutoff with the sort of St Ives Penzance or the Hale Penzance corridor, that A30 corridor. Um, when, once you get southeast of that, it's very medieval, and then you can just see there's that dark green starts, and then just carries on. So you've got the sort of rough heathland on the upland areas. This sort of all of this, these are sort of the hill, the hill tops really, and then all of this dark green prehistoric activity scattered all around. So the project is looking at these uh, sites I have a huge list of sites uh, some 45 that I'm supposed to be working on in reality I'm working on quite a few more than that I mean the project for my part of the project uh, it sort of they, they did a study of about 150 sites that were deemed to be of, of, of interest as, as part of this project and it was sort of sifted sifted out to about 45 um, but we we've worked on quite a few quite a few extra ones. So we generally go in first and do some vegetation clearance. We do site surveys to record the condition uh, of these sites. I mean, some of them might not have been seen for 50 or 60 years. They've been covered in vegetation for so long. So there's an element of checking the condition, um, and particularly um, in light of sort of climate change, which is, is having an interesting impact on some of these sites because the water levels are changing in the ground and some sites are becoming flooded that would never have been flooded or vegetation's doing slightly different things and as temperatures change. Um, so we're doing a bit of site research on some of them, um, reinterpreting some of these sites. Uh, it's not unusual for the county records for a site to be quite sparse. Um, so, so some of the sites are sort of at risk or in a poor condition because we just really don't know anything about them uh, or not very much at all. Somebody's made a note that there's something there. Someone in antiquity perhaps said, oh, yes, there's an interesting collection of stones here. We think it might be this. And that's kind of as much as the record can sort of say sometimes. So just going in and, and making a more thorough record of these sites will, and the conditions that they're in will sort of um, 
help help advance awareness of these sites and help people look after them really um so we're doing some repair work uh, not a huge amount um, a lot of the repair work is sort of cornish hedge based um, for hedges of varying ages some of them prehistoric some of them more recent but um always using authentic uh, skills um, and sort of local hedges and we've been teaching the volunteers how to how to sort of how to do Cornish hedging which has been fabulous really and um, later this year we're going to be doing some mortar repairs some lime mortar repairs on some of the, the list of buildings that we're looking at um, um, so a, a bit of conservation work on some of the sites not not an awful lot it's it's uh, this is this is a bit of an interesting one because you don't want to intervene too much in the site unless you see something sort of terrible is happening and particularly if it's a scheduled monument there's so many layers of administration to be gone through um some of the things we had hoped to do have just sort of shuffled out of reach because i don't have um it, untold amounts of time to to do sort of ad admin permissions but if, if we we can do a little bit of uh, repair, footpath erosion uh, through sites and, and things things that aren't too interventive. We're doing a bit of that as well. So that's that's pretty satisfying. I mean, whatever we do to a site, we leave it in a better place. So that's a really fabulous job to have, to be honest. Um, really nice. And the volunteers that work with us think so too. I think they get a lot out of it. It always looks better when they've gone at the end of the day than it did when they arrived. So um that's pretty good and it as as our name suggests a partnership we do lots of partnership working um, with organizations that already exist in the area um and in the county and and with a lot of land you know with a lot of landowners as well sort of individual landowners or the bigger estates or um, larger landowners like the national trust so so what <laughs> Uh, after that brief -ish introduction to what I'm doing and what we're doing and sort of why, I figured the best way to present some of the things that we've been finding is to stitch together a bit of a, a sense of how many layers of time uh, you're actually looking at when you look at West Penwith. You get a lot of people say, oh, it feels a special place. Uh, it, it, you know, we really like going there. It feels different. It's very uh, mystical perhaps or um special or different or wild or wh whatever people feel that it feels like you're in a slightly different place when you get there and quite often can't quite put your finger on why and working there so sort of in intensely i suppose for four years now we're, we've got a year and a little bit left to go it i've got a sense of being able to look back and piece together all the little bits and and come up with my own ideas as to why the place is special and I think the living the living historic landscape thing really holds true it's it's got an immense time depth and, and a lot of bits and pieces that you're looking at are really old some of them are neolithic um, people have been moving through the landscape for longer than they've been building on it and people tend to build things in meaningful places so the, the places were special before they even started building so in, in the way that that sort of subsequent each time period building its own things creating its own sense of place that's relevant to what they're doing there and then they, they're sort of building on top of and enhancing and slightly borrowing maybe bits and bobs of what was there before and you just get this sort of stacking up of history and it's, it's sort of all there to look at if you're an archaeologist or you're interested in history in that way once you know what you're looking at and how to read it you can just you can just see time marching backwards for four thousand years it really is quite astonishing so slightly boring to do this sort of chronological thing but it, it works quite well and, and i do have sites that we've been working on that i can show you that from pretty much all of those time periods though not the Mesolithic unfortunately um, but finds have been found uh, there are there is archaeological evidence in West Penwith of, of Mesolithic activity um, nothing from earlier than that um, although I'm sure people were around doing things but uh, no no 
uh, imprints left on the ground or in the land, really. So we know that uh, it's, it's a mobile population sort of making seasonal camps. I think this is the sort of best guess thinking now. Uh, you, like a territory, I suppose, like a herd moves around an area of land that it's grazing. Uh, Hunter gatherers were moving around a, an arena of landscape that, that suited them in a sort of seasonal sense. So summer camps, winter camps, this, this time of year the fish are best over here, this time of year it's best over there because things come into graze. Um, that, that sort of thing you get, uh, we do get, get pits, fire pits, flints, that sort of thing found. And they, they have been found sort of scattered here and there. They've only been found sort of incidentally, they're not features that leap out at you, it's not like a large monument or anything, so very, very subtle, very light, light sort of tread on a landscape and you're very lucky to catch glimpses of it really. Um, but I think, you know, people, people remember, you get this sort of, uh, um, you know, ancestral memory and, you know, you don't just get the Mesolithic people and then a big gap and then the Neolithic people, it's the same people just getting closer to modern time as they kind of go down the generations and you know people they, they stick to the same places this place works for them and when they have new ideas they try them out in the same place that they've always tried them out so you do get a sense of continuity kind of building up as you look at the features in this area so you get the I suppose the first things that start appearing on the landscape that you can go and see uh, are the sort of megaliths, the Neolithic uh, monuments. Quite often on hilltops, you get a very strong sense that uh, people were sort of navigating around this area and they were perhaps using these monuments as uh, marker points or important locations for whatever reason. Um, sort of people sort of starting to get a sense of this is this is our landscape, we want to build something in it rather than just sort of moving across it in a in a lighter way. So you get some tour top enclosures start happening. Now they're not necessarily there to keep things in or keep things out, but they're sort of they're marking boundaries to sort of places that are special, we think. And uh, and then these these sort of the coits are pretty classic and, and some of the entrance graves which tend to be a bit lower down in the landscape, sort of underneath the hill tops, but always, always looking at something very particular. Um, so looking at uh, another hilltop, very clear lines of sight between these monuments, um, quite often associated with uh, solar activity or, or sort of stars, ast astral stuff. So you're not just sort of, it's not people just looking at the feet and what's immediately around them. They're really looking out, looking out across the landscape and trying to connect it and they're making connections. And um, that really starts in the Neolithic and West Penwith is a really great um, place to see that happening. I'm going to show you, hopefully this works. Um, our landscape hub on our website. So if you went to the West Penwith, the Penwith Landscape Partnership website, you would get and the Trails and Ancient Sites page, you explore the plan. Oh, here you, we are. You might have to change the- um... Changing what I'm sharing. Yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, that's annoying. Um, I'm just trying to show you our our website. Um, can everybody, can you see that? Yes. It's like yes. A mass. yes. Perfect. Okay. So this is our it, area viewpoint. So they're sort of, it's a series of 360 degree viewpoints and you can jump from one to the other and you can, and we've labeled, you can tell all of these if you just want to look at the landscape all of the key points that you can see that, that they and they pretty much exclusive they, they 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 coincide with ancient sites so this is the top of watchcroft the highest point in west penwith you can pretty much see everywhere um 
and Khan Galva can be quite often seen from an enormous amount of Neolithic sites as well, which is quite interesting. When you're on the top, the hilltops looking around, you can see all sorts of things. Um, it's not just about, I think, seeing what's going on around you. Um, I think it, it was very important for people to be able to see certain points and sort of locate themselves within the landscape in that way. So we can sort of you can you can use go online and use it and jump from site to site, which is pretty pretty good fun actually. Um, so I just thought I'd show you that. Uh, I shall go through the tortuous process of resharing my screen. <laughs> Probably should uh, let's see where are we? Zoom. Share my screen. No. Oh, I see. Should not have done that. I'm going to have to turn this so I'm on that page. This happened last time. Um, is it not? Is PowerPoint not opening again? No, I've just turned it off and on again. Okay. Um, that worked last time. I tried to share my screen and it, there we go. There we go. It's back now. Amazing. Um, I might think twice about doing that again. Can you see that again? Yep. Sorry about this. Um, and we've been doing some really interesting 3D models of sites. Um, I won't, uh, if, if this was being a bit less clunky, I'd jump to some of the 3D models and show you, but I, I don't think I'm going to go through the pain of, of doing that and having to reshare my screen and turn everything off and on again. So, so this is a, a point cloud for the entrance grave at Trekker Seal. It's sort of just underneath. Tregosil Common. And um, if you're looking at it in Sketchfab, of course, you can sort of go inside it and zoom around it. And there's a version there that's that's sort of real photorealistic as well. So that, that's been really quite good fun. Um, one of the sort of surveys that we've been doing. And this is this is the entrance grave. I mean, before the volunteers got there to clear it, it was just a big mound of gravel, <laughs> not gravel, um, brambles. And now it's been rather nicely trimmed. Um, the cattle can get in and graze it properly, which sort of helps keep the vegetation down on an ongoing basis. And then we made some really nice formal archaeological sort of record shots and did a, a did a drawing as well. It's never really had a detailed archaeological survey drawing done of it. So it was a real pleasure to be able to do this and um, teach the volunteers how to how to do a survey and sort of interpret what they're looking at as they're doing it. So that was that was a good one. So you sort of after the the megaliths of the Neolithic, I suppose you've got uh, and I think at, at that point you don't get prehistoric, you don't get Neolithic ill boundaries appearing. I think people are probably doing a degree of farming, perhaps just um, encouraging particular things but we're already growing in particular places to grow a bit more perhaps not building a field and filling it with wheat sort of thing but noticing that certain types of grasses that were tasty or useful were working well in a certain area and maybe just helping them to grow a bit more so they could be cropped a bit more reliably perhaps that sort of thing starting to happen so farming that mindset shifting away from moving around to spending more time in certain places and that that really that becomes really consolidated in the bronze age people really settling down building sort of permanent or semi-permanent sort of settlements roundhouse settlements in certain areas very specifically because they are doing different types of agriculture or farm practice in different areas so you get um lots of field boundaries appearing very sinuous very um, um organic looking uh, if you like uh, little clusters of it's like a load of bubbles all stuck together sort of strange shapes just one springing up off the other off the other off the other and then scatterings of roundhouses in 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 amongst them really and um i get a sense that that particular small holding of uh, roundhouses was managing the land immediately around it and um, 
in the sort of associated areas upon the upland uh, where you've got sort of seasonal grazing moving seasonally between the upland grazing and the sort of better agricultural land lower down sort of towards the coastal plateaus and that that, that family would or group small holding i suppose uh, little little sub community groups would within the different habitats that they were working on they would perhaps have enough of a bit of this and a bit of that a bit of wheat a bit of forage a, a bit of uh, hunting or all sorts of things to to get them through the year and obviously trading as well because there's a lot of tin in cornwall and that tin gets all over the world pretty much um they found tin in uh, the Middle East um, at the time of the fairies ingots that were being traded all over all over the place really so not completely cut off from the world quite happy sort of selling their tin I think and getting on with their farming in, in, a, in an area that seemed to work really well for the type of farming that people were liking to do and cows I think grazing so you see the uplands today they're very heathy there's like vegetation they're very wild looking and overgrown and they'd have been very finely managed for grazing back in the bronze age as the time continued uh, it really i think very well grazed it, it would have looked quite different so that's uh, that's quite an interesting thing to remember when you're looking at the landscape it really wouldn't have looked like it looks today and you get uh, the monuments change from being megaliths to sort of smaller stone circles, a little bit less ostentatious, perhaps, and a bit more localised. So you're not necessarily looking at wanting to see them from a very long way away, but you want to see them from where your settlement is. So you tend to get sort of local monuments for local people, like more a community sort of in a certain area is starting to build build its own sort of micro landscape I suppose um, so we've had some nice reconstruction drawings done the drawing here is Sperris settlement which is a, a band of roundhouses on the shoulder of Sperris hill um, which would probably been sort of summer a summer grazing um, settlement so not necessarily occupied all year round the rest of the community down down slope on the coastal cliffs uh, tops so we'd be taking survey photographs of those hyper accurate drone imagery that uh, they're so accurate you can, to I know a few mil really you can um, you can take a, a, a you can draw off that and, and create a very accurate archaeological drawing. So this is a very useful tool. Um, Basiliac Round House Settlement uh, is a particularly nice one um, below Nine Maidens um, up near the Menantol at uh, sort of 11 or think of or so sort of little roundhouses and they're not necessarily continually occupied they seem to come in and out of use the, the few that have been excavated you get sort of layers of activity uh, a couple of activity periods in the Bronze Age as people have I don't know, maybe maybe people were over farming, you know, it worked for a while and then you you completely hammered the area around you. So you have to move somewhere different and then go back to it. Who knows? Um, th there's a suggestion of that sort of thing happening when you look at the pollen record on Bobbin Moor. But it, it, yeah, it's very hard to very hard to pin down. And then and then they, they get reoccupied in later time periods because it's a handy building. It already exists. Um, why not use it again? Uh, so, a lot of vegetation clearance here. This is really hard to find unless it's clear. Um, as you can see, the guy with the ranging pole. Is, uh, yeah, you can't really see what you're looking at when the, the bracken's up. Uh, so, as I said, you've got really good lines of sight from all the hilltops. Um, Nine Maiden Stone Circle is a fabulous uh, view straight over to the Carn Galva there in the distance. And then um, the field boundary sort of sinuous uh, tag on like little bubbles of fields and boundaries with the little roundhouses in all around Bartini Hill. You can see them just clustering underneath the hilltop there in those fields. Um, 
and then the monuments that were being built that were not domestic they're, they're kind of they're not really showy but they're um they're quite technically um proficient they can line up with various aspects of solar and astral um alignments at various times of year so you get that sort of sense of were they mapping you know seasons you suddenly get people being very interested in what time of year is it exactly you wonder if that's got anything to do with presumably agricultural practice now is a good time to sow now is a good time to do this that or the other because uh, if you get it wrong you, you might not survive the winter i suppose um we had um a very great fun redoing Bartini Castle which is, is quite strange it got reused as a hill fort in the Iron Age and I think everybody just assumed it was a, a hill fort but it's a really nice um, barrow enclosure on the top of the hill they have fabulous views from up there so you, you can see it from lots and lots of other places and um, it rather nicely lines up with the, the Milky Way and the autumn equinox so I had a star regression done which was quite good fun um, got an archaeo astronomer to recreate the night sky as it would have been in the Bronze Age, the Middle Bronze Age, when it would have been an active site. So yeah, that was good fun. So the Iron Age, I suppose we're working on quite a lot of sites uh, to, uh, from this period that, that there's, you know, as, as people from the Iron Age uh, sort of moving out of the Bronze Age, I mean, again, it's the same population in the same place. They're, habits and, and trends of, of activity are slightly changing and people are just reusing the landscape around them so you sort of you build on top of the earlier houses uh, you quite often get bronze age round houses incorporated into iron age uh, sort of houses and settlements and the courtyard houses quite often show evidence for having a sort of round house incorporated somewhere within them here and there so they, they sort of slightly more ritual bronze age circle sites on top of hilltops then get reused uh, quite often as hill forts in the Iron Age. So you sort of get an inner bank might be a remnants of a Bronze Age feature and then you get these sort of big outer banks start getting built. Um, so the archaeology can be a little bit confusing when you sort of look at it like what on earth, what on earth is going on here? Why, why have they done that? And then you, you sort of pick it apart because you, you, don't, you don't always have the luxury of being able to sink a trench through the thing and uh, find out for real what's going on so you have to sort of do a lot of guesswork based on the morphology of the site and what it looks like and trends on other sites where you have excavated. Um, so why are people suddenly building fortified rounds? Who knows they obviously wanted to protect themselves from somebody or each other or other other people coming in. Um, trying to pinch their stuff I guess <laughs> um, you know they've been trading quite successfully in the Bronze Age with by sea for tin you know very high quality assets never felt the need to defend themselves in such a way before now why it's probably a, maybe a societal shift people suddenly start thinking about things differently there's less community mindedness and it's more about personal assets and I want it it's mine I, who, who knows we can only guess but uh, things start getting quite defensive um, you get um, rounds appearing in the in the landscape so instead of just sort of round houses with no kind of outer outer bank or anything like that just round houses within their field system suddenly you stop they they tend to fall by the wayside and you you get these fortified rounds and then the houses are within the round so people really um, hiding behind walls for some reason and the, and the, the Bronze Age fields stay largely the same but they, they, they sometimes they get knocked into slightly bigger fields and a lot of the fields that you can see now as you're walking and driving through West Penwith are the sort of the, the, the prehistoric style fields that you see that, that remain are um, Iron Age now sort of incorporating Bronze Age um, design. So um, and they if they've survived they haven't they haven't really changed since the Iron Age. Um, 
you're just you're just looking at an Iron Age Cornish hedge. It's pretty astonishing, really. Um, and because it can be quite tricky to figure out what's going on on some of these sites, especially where you've got multiple periods of reuse. We've we've had a load of reconstruction drawings done, um, which it put the sites in the landscape a bit more. Although this one is fairly close too. So this is. This is Carebran Hillfort, which is an absolute stonker. Um, it's just been bought by Cornwall Heritage Trust as well, which is really exciting. Um, it was up for sale uh, recently. So you, you sort of you can see in the sort of shadow of the interior Bronze Age bank, I suppose, and then you've got this kind of huge defensive exterior bank um, being built. That, that that's what you see today and. Um, it's funny you don't you don't tend to get evidence of permanent habitation in these rounds, uh, these big castle rounds. Um, I don't think people were living them in them. Like this is our giant fortified citadel, and then throwing sticks at folks on the outside. That they seem to be mm, very showy. Uh, probably some showing off going on. Look how big our thing is. Um, perhaps uh, people retreated to them at times. Of strife so um, maybe they were like market you know trading centers and centers for activity but that, that doesn't seem to be you know evidence for them being peppered with with houses inside though castle and um does have quite a few inside it but most of the rest are pretty quiet on the inside not an awful lot going on um, and you get the same sort of thing but on the cliffs so they've not got a circular embankment they've got these across the neck of the of the promontory you build a series of very fine ramparts to keep people out um again it's has got roundhouse um platforms on it um, but not sure whether they were fully occupied or just occasionally occupied but you know people were retreating to to these places of safety which is quite interesting um and it's quite nice having the reconstruction drawings done. The lady that's been doing them, she looks at terrain models. Um, she's a gaming artist. So she's looking at the site in sort of three dimensions almost. And um, you think, oh yeah, Gurnet's head and it's very rocky. And uh, funny that all the houses are over there and then you go, oh, prevailing winds. Yes, you don't want to put your house on the windy side. And she's managed to bring that to life really nicely, actually. Um, but she's We'll hopefully be getting some more before the project's finished. Um, in the Iron Age, you get the famous courtyard house settlements, um, which are only found in West Penworth, and they are a delight to work on. Um, this one's Morphavine, uh, which was very grown over. Uh, we've been breaking open new areas of this so that we can record it and get the public able to go and have a wander around. And they, they really are quite astonishing. They're sort of Iron Age, they continue to be used through into the Romano-British period. And as far as we can make out, they seem to be the local version of a villa, really, like a, a Roman farmstead, um, kind of courtyarded area. Just decided they didn't like corner rooms in West Penwith and they'd stick with the round version. So we've been clearing the sites. Um, but also improving the access so people can get to them more easily from footpaths. So a picture of some new gates that have been put in and things like that. So quite quite a pleasure to be able to get people into these sites as well. Um, this is more for before and after some clearance work. Um, and what we've been finding is that uh, once you get rid of the horrible bracken and bramble monoculture, that blankets these areas, enormous amounts of bluebells burst forth. So always nice to go and visit these sites in, in the spring when the bluebells are out. So it makes the site photos look particularly scenic as well, which is quite nice. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the volunteers surveying using a plane table, which was uh, used quite extensively in the first world. <laughs> for as a sort of surveying technique and probably isn't that dissimilar from the Roman planning system so uh, yeah, it was quite it's been quite good fun um although we, we have done some of that and now we're capturing a lot more digitally as well but it's it was it was a very good fun exercise and these are the excellent drawings that the volunteers produced 
from it. So this is just a fraction of the courtyard health settlement. Um, yeah. Um, they're great. And whilst they were surveying, they, they discovered a brand new roundhouse within the settlement that nobody had noticed before. So that was rather nice. Um, this is the Salotra Hillis courtyard house settlement where there's a cluster of several courtyard houses all, all together just below Chun Castle. So pretty much guaranteed to be the population that was utilising the castle at Chun. This, this is where they were living. Um, brilliant brilliant place um much clearer to get into now um you can sort of see it from the footpath it's on private land but um you can ring up the landowner and she's more than happy for people to go and have a wander around just uh, prefers to be asked first but all the information for that's on the website who to you know how to get in touch with her and stuff um so yeah the trade trade continues apace copper and tin into the roman empire um, people often say the Romans, you know, there wasn't much Romanization in Cornwall. Um, no, no, not really. Um, didn't didn't really see a need to do it. I don't suppose they were getting all the tin and tin that they needed by happy trading. They didn't need to invade. Um, population chose not to take up the mantle of Roman life lifestyle. Um, so you get, you know, the courtyard houses they sort of built built largely in the Iron Age and, and they just continue on in use um, through to the Romano-British period and calling it Romano-British elsewhere in Britain that same time period would be very formally Roman. Um, you just don't get a, a huge Romanish uh, lifestyle kind of being introduced. You, you, you don't get the odd the odd object, obviously very nice Roman knickknacks appear but not a lot of them. And, um, yeah, people were quite happy doing what they were doing and going, oh, I like you. I like your shiny Roman stuff, but I'm all right with what I've got, I think. <laughs> so that that sort of, I, I'm not going, not going to say it's inward looking, but that's that sort of particular way of doing things in West Penwith that, that sort of perpetuates just reuse of the same field systems, reuse of the same places and spaces and arena the wider arena the way people are moving around the landscape it, it doesn't get very greatly changed by social change it, it, that's happening elsewhere in the country you, know, you don't get wholesale clearance of prehistoric field systems and introduction of roman field patterns like you do in other parts of the country um, people just carry on using the same the same um, footprint really like a fingerprint just gets deeper and deeper doesn't tend to change much and um, the Solatrilis is a fabulous example of that there it was before we started clearing it and then after you can stand in the rooms of the courtyard houses here and you know you really get a sense that it's a room and this is a particularly unusual one because it's a fortified courtyard house this is gold herring um iron age courtyard house um it's got a forge in it which is a wall and it's got a really heavy defensive banking around it and a big ditch um obviously they really wanted to protect <laughs> what was going on inside it presumably the metal working um, and, it, and it offers excellent views over mounts bay so if you do have a cache of metal that you are waiting to trade you can see boats coming into mounts bay i suppose and uh, your customers are waiting sort of thing um, but that's that's a great site to go and have a look at and volunteers will be doing a a proper plan of that later this year so that, that'll be good to get get that it's being hammered a bit by rabbits so uh, we're doing a lot of condition monitoring there um so the, these consolidated field systems um this sort of bazegrin farm uh, above the cliffs uh, cliffs at bazegrin you see a couple of courtyard houses and then this this sort of field system around it um, rather nice and the uh, volunteers clearing the courtyard house in the bottom corner there um, so i suppose that the general backdrop that you notice the thing that makes west penwith particularly old is, is predominantly the prehistoric sort of agricultural landscape hence the 
you know, the continually used prehistoric landscape sort of theme of the area. But that's not to say that, you know, it's frozen in time. Nothing new happened after the Iron Age. It's just that the, the shape of the agricultural activity didn't change much beyond then. Really, until the, you know, the medieval period started changing the shapes of the fields, but it, that sort of local way of doing things, I think, continued uh, after that and didn't change a great deal. So you get to the early medieval period, you start getting, um, I suppose the biggest difference would be the way that society was becoming organised. Um, tribal leaders, I think, is the the you know, less local sort of settlements looking out for themselves and then a bit more kind of you know tribal leaders overseeing an area. Um, I think it's thought, is it, that the hundreds, the hundreds of Penwith and the hundreds in Cornwall, that sort of that land unit they started possibly around about this time. So maybe zones where a lord was kind of managing a population. Um, and it, the main the main change in the landscape is that you sort of start getting inscriptions start appearing um, nothing more nothing more obvious than that really um, generally speaking uh, in a, the introduction of Christianity so you get you start getting very small cliff top chapels appearing um, we've worked on a few of them they're they're pretty they're pretty small and there's not much to see but they're very interesting um, and they Quite often associated with a holy well, which is common, um, a common pattern in West Wales as well, where you get uh, small early medieval uh, Christian sites often associated with either a holy water site uh, or um, uh, barrows and things like that. And Tregominion Chapel and Well was was a great fun. We we. We knew there was a chapel somewhere there. Everyone assumed it was in the small field that's triangular shaped where the well is. Um, turns out quite possibly it was not. Um, so we, we did do a dig here, some trenches. Found a very nice cobbled surface that covers the whole area between the well and the chapel. Completely unexpected. Um, and uh, we think we found the corner of the chapel. So the red box there is, is roughly where the, we think the chapel would have been, but it has been completely raised to the ground. And um, then the modern field system just sort of plonked over the top of it. So it has obviously been well removed for a very long time before those the field boundaries that you see today were there. And we, we'd assumed that the field boundaries that were there today in some way honoured the earlier Christian site, but it, it doesn't, doesn't appear to be the case at all. And um, rather interestingly, no, well, we know there's a holy well there, but on the other side of the site, so there's a sort of, um, if you look at the photograph, um, the aerial photograph, there's a sort of bare earth area with some stones poking out of it. That is what people thought the chapel was, but we're actually, we thought it might, we think it might be a barrow. <laughs> so we, we retreated from that quite quickly because uh, we didn't really want to dig that up. Um, so it's been very messed around with, but um, yeah, and we think we found a fallen Bronze Age standing stone as well, just a little bit further towards the coast. So, yeah, following that pattern of early Christian sites on top of a, a site where you've got a water source or potentially a holy well uh, source of some sort um, in association with sort of Bronze Age um, ritual activity or funerary activity. Um, so you start... I suppose the biggest the biggest impact that we see um, in West Penwith during the medieval period is, is really is the change to the field systems. You start getting um, medieval strip fields start appearing. You get much more formal rectangular fields, uh, very regular in size and shape, all to do with uh, the way the land's been managed and ownership. So post Norman invasion, the land gets parceled out. You've got people getting a tithe out of the population. It's much easier to tithe them if you know their land units are regular, all of that sort of it, agriculture becomes very formalized. So it's it's remained largely unchanged for a very long time. And then suddenly admin appears and and um, yeah, things things change. You, you just get these um, straight edge fields start pairing. Those uh, 
prop marks and things like that. Um, St. Levin Chapel, so perpetuation of use of these early and Christians, earlier Christian sites. Um, this is particularly exciting excavation at the end of last year. Um, it's falling into the sea. It was a scheduled monument. One never gets an opportunity, very rarely does so, to dig on a scheduled monument. But as this one is falling into the sea, we, we, we got permission to do that. And we got a grant, a large grant from Historic England that funded the work. Because um, it's uh, they're, they're working out a strategy for coastal management uh, on sites that are subject to coastal erosion, it, sites that are being lost, basically. And, what's the best way to record those sites and, and this was a trial site for, for what might happen uh, in the future on, on other similar sites. So we've got a, a chapel and a hermit cell, a holy well, um, all of these kind of key key pointers. There's a rather nice cleft stone in the churchyard further up the hill, um, lots of special things in a special place. Um, you can see the red outline of where the chapel and the cell are on the cliff top there and you can see it sort of falling away into the sea we've been monitoring it for about three years and it you know more of it is going was going every year so so we fully excavated it and there's a uh, a screen grab of the 3d model um, again you can see the 3d model of all of these this excavated site on if you go onto sketchfab dot com and just type in Penrith Landscape Partnership you'll see there several models from the chapel excavations so you've got a is it a series of contemporary buildings or is it a, a succession of buildings that have gradually moved away from the the coast edge as 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 um, water has, has started eating away at the cliffs so we're not quite sure I'm waiting for the um I'm waiting for the dating results to come back from the excavations. So this is very, very exciting because there's never been any formal dating evidence found on this chapel, although it's been assumed to be early medieval. Um, we didn't find any obvious uh, evidence to suggest that, but we know that it was definitely a very fancy chapel in the medieval period. So a real destination. And there seems to be a number of these around in West Penwith and, and elsewhere in Cornwall as well you know, real pilgrimage destination. So very small chapel, probably on the site of an older one or an embellished older building um, that, that, that were really sort of fancied up, I suppose, in the 13th and 14th centuries. Beautiful ridge tiles, uh, lovely slate roofs, tiny, tiny buildings. Um, but then I think the services were generally held outside. So the size of the building wasn't really a big problem. Um, you didn't need to cram loads of people in but yeah so people still coming in but the, the ritual sites in the area have changed moved away from the landscape for each sort of landscape monuments and then these coastal christian sites become the, the real focus so that's the dig archaeologists all roped up they had a way of the time um and that's the jug we found a jug there which is lovely um so a 14th century lost with your wear jug and it, it sat I think pretty much where it had been knocked over by a mudslide um, during a sort of flash flood or mudslide event that we think completely knocked the chapel out of commission so it was standing it would have been standing upright and and it, you can see it in the ground there it, it looks like it's just been tipped over on its side and if you sat it up um, there's a little drip of water that I think is the is the holy well water source that would have just dripped into the top of the jug and filled it up, which is just really brilliant, really lovely. Um, so the largest impact on the landscape after that was sort of garden gardening and um, mining, really. So taking advantage of the lovely climate um, and continuing to use small plots on cliff tops, um, the 1800s, flowers, and then early 20th century, it was new potatoes using these plots. They're incredibly warm. Um, you get uh, lovely early flowers. The uh, advent of the railway system um, meant that you could get these things to market very quickly up in London. 
make a lot of money. Um, yeah. The Camel Crease plots, I think, are the first recorded ones, and they're noted on the OS map as being called the, Gar the Garden of Eden, they were called, uh, which is quite evocative, really. And then the um, and then the mining, the mining landscape that we all know know so well that sort of sits on top of all of that earlier stuff. There's a sort of icing on the cake, really. Um, changes bits of it quite dramatically and yeah, leaves other bits completely untouched. So um, post medieval farmsteads are quite often overlooked because they're not prehistoric and everyone goes, oh prehistoric stuff, how exciting, and forget about the slightly more modern stuff. So we've, we've been recording a few of these as well. This is the first time this one's been plotted and recorded. So that was a real, a real pleasure. Um, there it is in detail. So sort of garden plots, agricultural buildings, all of these little, little things that just demonstrate the sort of localised farming, you know, that's just being perpetuated down the years. And then I suppose now it's uh, a lot of tourism. So we've we're just sort of helping people, helping people understand what they're seeing a bit more through the project, which is which is rather which is rather nice because people don't often. And then this goes for the landowners as well. They don't really realise what they've got on their land. They look at it every day. They know it's a bit old and a bit stony. And you go, oh, you do realise that's an Iron Age hedge. And they go, oh, didn't realise that. And then, yeah, just exciting people's interest. And that was what a pleasurable job that is, to be honest. Um, yeah, so you get a sense of such a great time depth and, and everything just sitting one on top of the other. And even if the physical remains have gone, you've still got the crop mark remains that there and, and so much still underneath the ground. Um, you get intensive modern agriculture has ploughed out some of these features. Um, but there's there's still shadows there under the ground, just they're missing the top bits. Um, it's just sort of helping people understand the special landscape they're in and how they can sympathetically manage their land to avoid further damage as well. Is 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 just uh, kind of makes this a uh, sort of the project quite quite nicely complete. Um, sort of helping it to remain. A living working landscape really that's that's sort of very historical because it you know you can't just freeze a place in time and expect it to survive i mean this landscape has survived because people have continued to use it and people will continue to use it and, and just sort of raising awareness of of the kind of extreme age of some of it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem but it, it sort of people people know people know it's a special area and they they want to on the whole, try and try and keep it like that. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's a complicated place, but it's a fabulous place. Um, multi layered and complex is is about it, really. <laughs> I mean, some of these boundaries are absolutely ancient. You know, they haven't changed. You're looking at the same hedge that it would have been there four thousand years ago, and it's still being used as a, as a hedge to keep cows in today. And you think, wow. That's pretty amazing, really. Definitely gives it that distinctive old feel. Um, so that's 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 it, really. Um, hopefully, you found it interesting. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour. There's so much to talk about. But uh... well, <coughs> amazing. Thank you. <laughs> that was really good. Uh, the uh, illustrations, the uh, the high spec drone imagery that was amazing uh, and the three models i have put in the chat the link to that if anyone does want to um follow that up also it will be in the uh description or whatever wherever this will be uploaded it'll be somewhere around that as well um and to kick off is, is it okay to jump straight into a q a Laura? Of course, it, of course it is. Yes, I must apologise for the jumping in and out of various screens. I had to show, hope to show you those are 3D model of the jug, um, but it was it was all just a bit too painful, so I didn't bother. It's you cool. can go and look at it yourselves afterwards. So yes, questions. Uh, we have first one striking off. Uh, one from Pamela Munoz. Um, she's asking, 
Are there similarities between arrow points found in Penwith and those found in the Americas of the same time period? Arrow points are flint or metal? I'm assuming flint. Um, like um, flint, because that's when flint. she sent the flint. thing. Yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, only, only in the sense that there's um, similar material, it fractures in a similar way. I think the technology to, to make points out of these materials does develop in parallel, I think. I mean, I'm not a lithics expert, but um, I think more um, obsidian is often used in the Americas and, and some quartz materials, uh, whereas in Britain it's generally flint. I mean, I have seen quartz uh, tools uh, in West Penwith, but as far as I know, I don't. I don't know that they were, you know, looking looking to each other for um, manufacturing tips. I, I think it's just an example of sort of parallel development at, at, at the same sort of at the same time. But um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure an ethics expert will be able to tell you more. Right. Um, I was wondering how would there's, there's obviously a lot of volunteering work going on. Um, mm -hmm. How would one get involved? Fun stuff. Oh, you can just start, you can sign up on our website. Um, once you're signed up, uh, you you get the weekly emails that tell you what, what activities are going on where. And then you just come out, uh, you get all the training on site. If you haven't got it, all the tools are provided. Um, if you haven't got kit, we can lend it to you. Um, yeah. Yeah, just sign, sign up and, and pick, a, pick, pick something you want to come to. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has a question or wants to jump in. <laughs> in. Uh, um, so following from that, the partnership sort of system you have set up here, is this something that's been employed elsewhere in the country or something that's going to be planned to be put in in other distinct regions with a distinct sort of cultural, I don't know, identity? <laughs> well, um, landscape partnerships, um, they're a definite thing that the, the, the National Lottery Fund um, funded. This is one of the last big ones. There, there have been some really big ones done, um, I think, around the place. There's one, um, there was one around the sort of Bristol and Avon area, I think. But they're, they're I think, often deemed to be reasonably unsuccessful um, because they don't have lasting effect. And this, the, the funny thing about them is it, like the, the shape of normally the shape of a landscape partnership is it's two or three people in an office distributing funds to subcontractors in a region with a couple of sort of defined outputs. This is a strange setup in that all of the specialist offices have been employed direct in the same office so we're not having those specialisms subcontracted out. Uh, we're all working together to sort of help inform each other's kind of work strands and um, that I think has made it particularly successful. So I mean, we do feed this stuff does get fed back to the lottery. Um, whether it, it inspires other, other projects elsewhere, I, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it does. Um, but it's uh, they're tending the lottery project are, are tending to move away from funding large partnership projects like that to to, to more discreet ones because because we've got. Uh, 13 different project strands that are different subjects, so like farming based or ecology based or whatever. Um, I mean, they do overlap a bit, but um, it, other ones I've seen have, have fewer strands. Um, uh, I mean, the monumental improvement project uh, that's been happening uh, with the AOMB, that, that was lottery funded. And if they get their sort of next tranche of funding, um, That'll be, you know, it's like a, it's a landscape wide project, but it has a much tighter remit. It is just sort of ancient sites and community sort of side of things. So it would just be the sort of equivalent of my role or my part of the project. So, yeah, yeah, funny, the, 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 the big, enormous, baggy landscape partnership projects of older sort of no more. This is one of the last big ones that they, they funded, really. So, yeah, I don't know. That's up for 
I think that more local, more local small scale projects is probably the way it's going to go um, elsewhere. Cool. Uh, nothing to stop people from trying. <laughs> Take a punt, give it a go. You're going to set up, set up your own. <laughs> um, Alan says here, I think the lasting success will be due to organisations taking up the work once the project is finished, e.g. Yeah. Cornwall Ancient Pen with I can't, I can't remember what this acronym yeah. means, but Caspen. <laughs> Caspen, yeah, the Cornwall Ancient Sites Protection Network. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean they they are a key partner to the project. I work with them an awful lot, and um, certainly a lot of the um, site work I'm doing complements site work that they're they're already doing. Um, so we we work on some of the same sites, and um, but yeah, some different ones, but. Uh, what what we're doing now with this sort of last year and a half or just under a year and a half is is trying to set up a legacy project really and, and that that is going to absolutely have to include local local community groups that already that we already work with um and, and organizations that, that that do that sort of work so yeah we're, we're waiting to see what what happens next as well hopefully something because it's great it's been really good and you know, people want there to be something that comes after, and that and that's that's good. That that's a good start. So it's just trying to figure out a realistic uh, funding stream for that. That's that's what's happening at the moment. So. Landowner awareness and pride should help too. That's that. That's yeah. Alan pointing that up. Yeah, um, yeah, good, good point. Um. So. Bartini Castle, you were sharing earlier with the um, Archaeoastronomy by Catherine Kennett. Is that yep, something yep. that's available on the website as well? A yep, sort of yeah, all the, yep. all, all the reconstruction drawings are up there with a little description of what it is you're looking at um, on, on the website, the um, Penrith Landscape Partnership website. Um, I think there's, if you type in, if you go to the website and click on access and ancient sites, it's one of the, one of the, um, bits under there you can just click on and it takes you through to all the reconstruction drawings um, and it, it'll tell you which, which which phase of that that site's history that that particular drawing represents so. amazing um i don't want to hog the thing the whole time um i'm aware of the fact that it is 20 past and you do have uh a big old pot arriving um Yes, yes, I'm expecting <laughs> one in 10 minutes or so to arrive, yes. Uh, <laughs> Alan has said, many thanks, Laura, and uh, a very interesting session and good overview of the historic cut timeline. And there's been some other people who I had to leave as well. Um, Judith. That's right. Awesome. Okay, That's in that case, thank you. I have thanks for one, more <laughs> one more question. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a bit. Um, um, uh, what's, the, what's the word? Uh, it's, it's not so. Uh, it's a bit provocative. I don't know. Um, what is, well, I'm saying that word on Valentine's Day doesn't feel oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of question is it going to be? All right. All right. What Thank what God. sort of question? Uh, what, what sort of fugus? Oh, the, oh no, fugus. What, <laughs> what isn't a fugu? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. They're great spaces. Um, and are all of them really fugus or are some of them crows? Who knows? Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I'm working a, a bit at Lower Biscaswell fugu and it doesn't, it doesn't follow the classic description of what a fugu is. I mean they're very similar to the souterrains that you get in Brittany and Ireland and um, they don't appear to be particularly well suited to storing food. I think they, were, and they don't generally have a lot of fines in them. No. Um, you don't get a lot of evidence in them. I should imagine they were a bit like the really useful cupboard that you use for all sorts <laughs> in a cupboard under the stairs. I mean some of them appear to have, um, they have egress points so you can potentially get out of the settlement. They're always inside a, a settlement. Um, but 
Yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't know. They don't. I don't think it's a, an excellent place to hide yourself if you're being raided because because you can't get out properly. Um, yeah, it, a ritual space. Um, probably lots of things actually. Um, they seem to be important enough that they, you know there are quite a few of them. Mm. It's not just like a one-off. Um, and you do you do get. Um, I mean, in West Penwith, around the Botalic area, um, and um, lower of the Scaswell and sort of Pendeen, you get these um, Cornish Great Walls. I mean, they're, they're Iron Age, but they're absolutely massive, and they have rooms inside them. Like some of them, uh, I think Pendeen Val, Fugu, and they're quite near to that. Is a you just call it an Iron Age pit, but it's like a big round room, like that's built inside this kind of Cornish hedge structure. And you can sort of see the parallels with that sort of having a, a hidden space within a settlement, um, but instead of it being an underground passage or a partially underground, partially above ground passage, it, it's sort of entirely above ground, but completely buried within this hedge. And, and then you get that, that sort of idea perpetuated in the post medieval crowds. Uh, some of them are animal houses, some of them are storage, some of them were used as sort of dairy rooms, um, cellars, all sorts of re reasons why they, they've been built. Um, so, yeah, pe people have found a dark passage or room underground or, or nearby to a settlement to be useful or meaningful for a long time. Um, yeah, I think they probably had different different functions. Um, it's not a very satisfactory answer. As you get an answer, as many archaeologists as you ask, you get a different answer. <laughs> I, I don't think there will be ever a definitive one. Anytime Do we soon. need to know? Do no, we no, we don't. Isn't it nice to have some mysteries? Mysterious. That's something yes. to argue about in the pub, surely. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stop recording. Okay. Thing. No voice on the record so i'm gonna thank everyone for watching later who's been watching this later and uh have a good rest of your day slash evening or other time of day um <laughs>